Let's go ahead and turn to Malachi. I need to check this because I think I got that wrong address on there. I know I have the wrong address on there. I think it's chapter 2. Yeah. I had chapter 3 on there. I don't know why I just wrote Malachi chapter 3. That's weird, isn't it? That, that just came out by habit. This morning, um, I have a message that's kind of been brewing in me for some, some time. I wasn't ready. I wasn't ready for it. Matter of fact, as I've put the finishing touches on it this morning, I, I was like, Lord, uh, I know it's kind of too late for this, but uh, do you want me to, to wait on this until, and, and I, I feel like what the Holy Spirit's going to do this morning is he's, he's going to in, in, uh, just drop something inside of us. Because over the past, I'd say months, but it's probably been over months. Well, no, it's been months. Um, this has been something that has uh, weighed on my heart. Um, not in a bondage type way, but in, in, in an importance type way. Um, it's marked me. And, well, let me get, let's get into it. I heard the Holy Spirit. Well, I shouldn't say heard the Holy Spirit, but this has just been going... Could have been the Holy Spirit. I think it was, I know it was instigated by the Holy Spirit. But he said, what happens when this generation's gone? This older generation's gone. And again, I know, I know, we, I know we got older generation in this, in this church. And, and some people will say, well, we're all different generations. Well, I'm talking about the generations that um, are moms and dads and grandmas and grandpas. Uh, what happens when we're gone? Um, it rose up inside of me. Um, I gotta guard how I say this because I don't want to. Um, but earlier this year, still believing for her her return. But our how can I word it? I'll just say it. Uh, one of our greatest sowers and tithers and givers of our body um, went into assisted living and is an hour and a half away from us and is and and her her son who has power of attorney and and I guess a, a guardianship I'll just leave it at that has has put the kibosh on us visiting um, he took control of all of her finances. Therefore, the biggest giver in our body at 85, 86, something on that order. I know you're not supposed to tell women's age, but um, is is no longer able to do what she's done and what has um, what has been essential to the church. Now, I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that. Listen, I'm not saying this. I'm not putting any pressure on anybody, okay? That, that's no, that has nothing to do with this. But since that time, I've just kept hearing the Holy Spirit says, what happens when this generation is gone? What, if, what happens when this generation who have given and tithed and, and caught the vision of, of Almighty God is past? Is are, is the church world just going to watch uh, uh, church attendance continue to be more and more optional? How many know that if if the church attendance is uber optional, there's a time where you don't need a church anymore. How about how about what happens when this continues on and? And uh, and the tithing and the giving continues to, to decrease and be be you know what Pastor Mike is like you know people finding being free from tithing and giving also free from receiving but that's a different you know what happens what happens when the tithers and the givers are gone. What happens when 
though the generation that answered the call to the ministry is replaced by a generation who doesn't find the ministry as as essential what happens when all the church becomes is a business organized by businessmen grown by business practices and the fire's gone the fire of the older generations are gone what happens i know i know some people are like well pastor that god will raise up someone As I was meditating on this, beloved, we're, we're, the Holy Spirit, I probably have not preached on quote unquote revival in a really long time. That used to be one of those Sunday night things that I would I'd minister on every so often. And I've just, yesterday, um, about 11 o'clock, I, we realized we needed to get our dog the heartworm pills to, to take and the worm pills uh, to take and and so, so Jessica said, snap, snap, get on, get on. Do it. Okay, she didn't do that. But I went and I got stuff. So I'm driving to Olive Hill the other way, Bath, Owings, Owingsville. I knew it started with an O. Um, started driving to, to Owingsville. And I, beautiful day, rolled down my windows, opened up our, our moonroof, I guess they call it, and I jammed. The song that we were just saying. Let the wind blow. Let the tide roll. Tell the earth knows. He's a God of love. Let the dry bones sing a new song. All the glory to the God of love. Hey! And then revival's in the air. And here I am driving down the road with wind just gushing at me. Revival's in the air. And the reality of what the Holy Spirit had been talking to me about, progressive, increasingly, and especially more towards Friday, just started overtaking me. We are in need of a revival. Restoration. Relationship. Intimacy with God. Matter of fact, I would say revival can be almost best uh, defined as a as re revive or a coming back unto which I the thing that I've always seen is that it's coming back. Uh, what is it? the prophets always said? He's bringing us back to days like the Garden of Eden. How things are supposed to be. Well, how were they in the Garden of Eden? Well, they were rich, Pastor Thad. They were they were healthy, Pastor Thad. Pastor Thad. Pastor Thad. All those things are true, but they were also dependent. Of walking with God, fellowshipping with Him, intimacy with Him, knowing His voice, knowing His ways. That's what revival is. We we, we called what, what what was happening at Asbury revival, and and I I it was great. I, I think there was what were some of the words that were better uh, awakening. But again, I, I just I always feel like a bunch of college students not wanting to go to class maybe is good, you know. Maybe he's not, I don't know, I don't know. But revival is more than just the church service that goes long. Or it is the daily walk with God, the intimacy and the fellowship with God, where his voice is what we listen to. We don't sit in the seat. We don't, we don't stand in the way of sin. We don't, we don't uh, stand stand in this scorn. What he did. Read read that. We're not listening the counsel of the ungodly. We're not we're not listening to the counsel of the ungodly. We're, every breath, every every part of our being is listening to the voice of God and walking with Him and fellowshipping with Him. But I will say this. And again, these are just things. 
I was, I, I was at my desk and I was just kind of writing things down. I was looking things up and, and it rose up inside of me. What's the most important generation for revival? My answer would be the next one. And I know some of y'all going, but what about us, Pastor Thad? That's what we're here to talk about. Because if it ain't happening in us, it's not going to happen in them. If we're not in love with God, they're not going to be in love with God. If we're not in love with his church and his body, they're not going to be in love with his church and their body. The younger generations won't carry out that relationship, the fire, and the church will disappear if we don't do something. Go over to Malachi 3. There, you, you, two, two, dose. Um, I just I want to I want to get into this, and that was kind of my opening a little bit, just to kind of get us to go where, where God's taken us this morning. But in Malachi chapter 2, verse 14, I'm going to read this out of the New American Standard Version. Um, but it says, Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth, because whom you have dealt treacherously, though she is your, your marriage uh, companion, your wife by covenant. So, so he's talking about the husband and wife. And then he says, But not one has done so as a remnant of the Spirit. And why the one? What in the world is he talking about? This next line. God was seeking godly offsprings. Be careful about your spirit and see that nobody deals treacherously with the wife of their youth. In other words, moms and dads, dads, love your wives, wives, uh, honor your, your husbands. Why? Because it's your job to raise godly children. I got a job. I got to. I got to go to work, and I got to raise money. No, it's your job. job. Number one is to raise godly children. Go to Genesis chapter seventeen. I, I taught similar, similar a couple of years ago when we did our family uh, uh, faith and family month. I, I taught a, uh, on, on the generational um, blessings, and that's kind of what we're dealing with here. Genesis chapter 17, verse 7, God speaks this to Moses, or to, uh, to Abraham. He says, I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee. The most important thing you will ever do in your life is to, is to raise godly seed. Sometimes when we start focusing, and again, I believe that we need to honor God with our money because if He doesn't have our money, He doesn't have us. If He doesn't have us, He doesn't have our, our seed, our kids. So money is important. But a lot of times when we hear the word seed, the only thing we think of is giving money. But we need to understand the highest level of seed that God ever gave mankind was His offspring. And it is our job that, not the, that the blessing doesn't stop with us. But it moves on to our seed after us. First Chronicles 16. Hallelujah. Holy Father, just let your words come through my mouth. My mouth, my mouth. Hallelujah. I, I almost feel like I need more than one mouth just to get to get everything that I want to get into us today. God is stirring us. And he is stirring this generation because God doesn't have just an eye for this generation, but he has eyes for the generations in the past. God understands the church is as only, only as strong as the generations that are following. Oh, I, I'm, I'm so excited. I got, I got so much I want to get into here. Uh, 1 Chronicles 16, 15. Be ye mindful always of this covenant, the word which he commanded to a thousand generations, even of the covenant which he made with Abraham, oath to Isaac, and hath confirmed the same to Jacob for a law. 
and to Israel for an everlasting covenant. How does an everlasting covenant become an everlasting covenant? It's that we pass it on to our seed. God is a God of generations. He is a God who honors generations. Go over to Matthew 1. Have you ever tried to start reading the Bible from Matthew chapter 1? And by about verse 13 or 14, you're like, you start bogging down. It's, it's bad enough if you're reading them from up here and you have to read it out loud, all those names. Uh, but when you're, you know, you're reading it now and you're uh, in the quietness of your going, uh, you just feel like you're speaking in tongues. Shambarati, begat bada babu, you know, and, and you're just going on with that. But, but why, why is Matthew chapter 1 in there? Because God's telling us he's a God of generations. And he starts the book of the... What's, what's the fifth word in there? Generation. I know genealogies, all that kind of stuff, but it's the book of the generations. This is a generational book. The Bible is not a book for a generation. It is a book for generations. Hallelujah. This is Abraham. Begat Isaac. Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob begat Judas, his brethren. Judas begot Pharaoh and Zara. It goes on and on and on and on. But I want you to get down there to verse 17. One of my favorite verses in the Bible because it's a book of generations. So all the generations from Abraham to David were 14 generations. Go ahead. You can count it. Don't do it right now. Count it later. Count it. You'll find 14 generations. Boom, 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 14. It says, and from David until the carrying away into Babylon, 14 generations. Count it. David, one, two, three, four generations. Back carrying away, 14 generations. Ooh, God's, God's got this thing going. A God of generations. And from the carrying away of Babylon onto Christ are 14 generations. Count it. Carrying away Babylon. Boop, 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 boop. Christ, 13. What? God lied. The Bible's wrong. Can I, can I remind you of a scripture in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9? It says that we are a chosen. Where's that 14th generation? Right here. From the time that Jesus produced the early church, the church, Zion, us, His glory, we're that 14th generation. And we are that 14th, the chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation. We are that generation. Well, how does that generation keep moving on? With our seed. When we stop, what, what, is, what, what, is our, what is this generation? Not picking on anybody because no, the baby's not here yet. <laughs> I talked to Ryan and Ryan's like, Man, they got to start spanking their kids more. <laughs> what is this generation? Oh, we're just going to put them in time out. We're just going to look at them badly. It's their personality. We don't want to take away their personality. We don't want to take away, you know, we got to let their personality bloom, Pastor. We can't punish them. Spoil the rod or spare the rod, spoil the child. I'm not saying beat them till it hurts, but gee, beat them, they won't die. I mean, if they're dying, you're doing it wrong. Just let you know. Our job is to raise godly seed so that the generations of the upright are blessed. So the generations that come after us are continue as the generation that that that. Jesus produced on the cross. I know some of us are going, Pastor Thad, is this, are you just talking to the young ones here? Are you just talking to? And, and then others are going, well, Pastor Thad, it might be too late for us. Oh, I'm, we're going to get in there, baby. We're going to get in there here this morning. I know you're sitting there thinking, are we not already in there? Let, let's go. 
let, let, well, let me, let me say it like this. So our job, how do we become that? How do we do that? You say, well, Pastor Thad, my kids are grown. My kids are adults. What do I do to do that? Or what, what do I do to, to, to continue that generation, the upright? Listen, he, our, our, our job, ready for this in this room? Our job is to be hungry for revival, to be hungry for God, to be hungry for relationship with him, to be hungry for intimacy, to be hungry for his ways, to be hungry for his word, to be hungry for him, to not allow a day go by. How many people in this room remember your moms or your dads praying in the house, praying? Maybe they got up really, really early and they would be at the kitchen table praying for you, praying for their seed. Beloved, that is our job. Our job is to be hungry for the move of God. Hungry. Don't be the people that are like, man, when is church going to be out? Or do I have to go to church today? Be the people that are hungry for the word of God and hungry for the move of God and hungry for the things of God so that there's nothing else that can satisfy that itch. Nothing else that can satisfy that longing. Because the world is going to bring a bunch of stuff to your seeds eyes, to your seeds uh, desires. And the thing that will be consistent is mom and dad praying for them. Mom and dad seeking for God. Mom and dad doing things. Again, you may look at yourself and say, my kids, man, they're not tithers. They're not givers. Let them continue to see you give. Let them continue because it will, cont it will be contagious. You know how I operate today in regards to giving is a direct result of watching my dad do it, watching my mom do it, both, both. Dad had, dad, there was a level dad had some catching up to do with mom. Dad was always a giver. I'm not saying that. He would give the missions. He would give to this. He'd give to that. The mom was always ready with the 20 or $30 bill. She had a lot of $30 bills. I don't know. That's what that printing press was downstairs. No, I'm just kidding. She was already always ready. I, I remember more than once just going over, walking through, saying, Mom, we're, we're leaving, Mom. I love you. And she would go, I love you too. And instead of giving me hugs, she just put her hand in mine. And I'd go, what's her? Mom, I really love you. And then I'd give it. So I like blessing my kids. I like giving money. I like blessing those around me. I learned it from my, I learned it from the generation beyond uh, above me. So be hungry for revival, hungry for God, hungry for relationship, hungry for his ways, and then bring that hungry to your children. Let your children see because their them being that having that same hunger is essential for the generation to come. When our hunger stops, revival and restoration stops. What God wants to do in America stops. Go to Judges chapter 2. I want to show you this scripturally. The most important thing you'll ever do is to teach your kids faith, Teach your kids to give. To teach your kids to walk with God and to desire God. But they don't want to come to church. It's your job. Get them to church. Because if they ain't hearing it at church, they're hearing something somewhere. Are you in Judges too? This is... This is um, well, I don't have to spend a lot of time. They're in the they're in the promised land. They've journeyed for forty years, and 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 again there was a there was what there was a generation who died off in the wilderness, and there was a generation who rose up in the wilderness. Oh, I want I want you need to hear that one again. There was a generation who died off in the wilderness. And there was a generation who rose up in the wilderness. The generation who died off in the wilderness was 
listen, listen. We went, well, okay, we'll do whatever. We talked about this uh, the other day. I don't know if it was last Sunday or if it was Wednesday. Uh, they, they were listening to uh, – <laughs> try to be quiet. I know you're trying to be quiet. <laughs> Amen. I just, it was, I was like, I was like, just, I love you guys so much. But they died because all they did was listen. Um, Oh, we go to church. We march to church. Oh, we sing some songs. We sing some songs. But in the, in the middle, they complained and whined and didn't walk it out. The generation that rose up was the generation that crossed the Jordan on dry land, brought down Jericho, and came into the promised land and took what was promised. Are we raising up a generation to move in, to rise up? Are we moving a, are raising a generation where things are dying off? What a, what a, picture there. But in Judges chapter 2, we see Joshua, um, it it talks about the the transition. Verse 7, and the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua. Why? Because they, they, they rose up. They rose up in relationship. They were like, okay, we're going to walk around. We're going to walk around the walls. We're going to walk over. We're going to walk with God. We're going to walk in through. How many walkings did they do? Walk through the uh, Jordan, walk around the walls, walk into the land. Every place that you set your feet is yours to take. They did a lot of walking, a lot of taking, didn't they? This gen- that's the generation. And they served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders that outlived Joshua and had seen all the great works of the Lord that He did for Israel. So this is that generation. This is the generation led by men who, it was Exodus uh, 33, I believe it is, where Moses went into the tabernacle of the congregation and met with God and talked to God like a man talked to the friend. And then he left. But Joshua, the son of Nun, a young man, that's the name of a generation, isn't it? A young man departed not. Because he just wanted to be in his presence. It's like fire shut up in his bones. He, he wanted to experience all that God had for him. And it was that generation. It was the Joshua generation that came, that walked into the promised land. They pressed. They went hard after the promises. When battles came, they, 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 they overcame them. They walked around them. They, they encircled them with their faith. And they received. They saw miracles. They saw walls fall. They saw waters divide. They saw fire by night and clouds by day. This was a generation that came in. And then Joshua died. and That generation died. Verse 8, Joshua the son of Nun, the servant of of the Lord, died being 110 years old. And they buried him uh, in the border of his inheritance in the Mount of Ephraim. On the north side of Gosh, of the hill Gosh, hmm, Gosh, and also, <laughs> and also, all that generation were gathered under their fathers. So they all that generation left. That generation passed. Where did they leave? Here's what they left. They left the next generation who heard stories, but didn't experience. They left, they left a generation that had enjoyed what mom and dad had, but not a generation that had taken anything for themselves. And notice the transition as one generation moved to the next. And also, um, verse 11, And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, well, no, let me verse 10, I'm sorry. And, all, and also all the generation that, that gathered unto their fathers, and there arose yet another generation after them, which knew not the Lord, nor yet the words, which yet works that he had done for Israel. And the children, of, as that next generation, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord and served Balaam. And they forsook the Lord God of their fathers, 
which brought them out of the land of Egypt, followed other gods of the gods of the people that were around them and bowed themselves unto them, provoked the Lord to anger. What happens when a generation rises that all they all they know is living in the promises of mom and dad, but not knowing how mom and dad got there? But not knowing the God of mom and dad. What happens when that generation rises up? They will produce the next generation that doesn't need God. That middle generation is a generation that is not an evil generation because they know all the form and formality. Mom and dad worship God like this. Mom and dad killed the ox. Mom and dad killed the ram. Mom and dad offered incense. Mom and dad did all this kind of stuff. They know all the do's and don'ts, but they don't know the doer. And so what do they produce in their next generation? those that don't know God at all. They don't even understand why mom and dad do that anymore. Why do you go to church? We don't need to go to church to be a Christian. And it becomes people that, what it says, they forsook God, the God of the fathers, that brought them out of the land and began attaching themselves to other gods. That last generation, that generation removed from revival is a generation that no longer knows God. Let's, let's, go, to, uh, let's go to Genesis. I don't know how many scriptures I'm going to look at in here because I, we know the, the accounts here. We know the stories here. The stories of three generations. We've already read about them several times. In this Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, three generations. We start with a generation, that first generation, that first generation that really didn't know God, but he had an experience with God. God shows up in Genesis chapter 12 and says, I'm calling you. Again, what, what, what relationship? Do, we don't know what relationship he had with him before then. What we do know is that he had an experience with God and God changed him. And Abraham learned to know the voice of God. He learned to know the power of God, to watch him work in his life. Uh, Abraham fought battles and won. Abraham tithed and sowed and increased. Abraham moved the hand of God with Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham took risks following the voice. Oh, go to a land that I'll show you. Let's do it. Take your son up to a mountain and kill him. Let's do it. Folks, if you've got a wife, that's the riskiest thing of all right there. Do it. Do it. Abraham did. Don't tell her. And by the way, Ryan, let's go somewhere tomorrow. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Are you, are you, do you see that? That first generation was birthed out of God speaking into his, his heart and it burning inside of him and causing him to, to, to go and to step out and do great things. To take territory. Move into this land. I'll move into this land. Just like God. Move into this land. I'm going to take land for God. Moving. That's what that first generation is. He experienced God. Did he have mistakes? Oh, he had mistakes. The strife that was between him and and uh, the and Lot's herdsmen and the whole Ishmael debacle. But you know what? Those mistakes, he didn't stop. He just kept trusting God. He kept believing God. And God brought him out. God brought him out with the promises, with increase, with blessings, because he wouldn't stop. And then came Isaac. And there's nothing about Isaac that is bad. I mean, I was looking at this thing, and, and Abraham took up about 13 chapters. Uh, Jacob takes up at least 13. I mean, probably 20. The, the, the light, I mean, it's funny because they start talking, uh, Genesis starts talking about Jacob, and then all of a sudden, somewhere in, in Jacob's story, it goes, oh yeah, Isaac and Rebekah died.
He was born again in, 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 our, in our vernacular. He knew God. He had seen what God had done to Abe for his dad. He enjoyed what God had done for his dad. He inherited the vision easily. He didn't pay the price for the vision. He lived in the territory. He didn't take any new territory. He saw blessings of God on Abraham, but he was one step removed from them. I heard one person say he lived in the afterglow of his father's faith. But he never pressed in. Have you ever thought about Genesis chapter 26 where God, the famine hits the land and, uh, and he goes, don't go down into Egypt. And remember, re- remember how he, he, go, he set up in Gerar and he dug wells and was prospering and it, in that land he reaped a hundredfold, right? God's blessing him, right? Well, remember, they came and took his land to fill in the holes. And, and you know what he did? He started moving south. If I had a map up here and watch all the steps along the way, he kept moving closer and closer and closer to Egypt. Because if you, I, I, we don't have it up there, but if you'll remember, i got to get my map up here. Uh, the, the Mediterranean's like right there, up here, and right here, and Egypt's right down here at the bottom of it. And this is the promised land here. And he started in Gerar, and then he moved, he kept moving south. He wasn't in it. He never went to Egypt. But he kept getting closer and closer and closer. Matter of fact, I think it's in Genesis 26. Go to Genesis 26, 24. Just look what it says here. This is what Isaac, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee. And I will bless thee and multiply thy seed for. I want. We need to get this. Isaac wasn't after the things of God. Matter of fact, I heard one person put it like this: Isaac was after venison. I know that that moved the heart of Pastor Mike there. No, he sat in his room and honored venison above God. And I just, I thought that, I thought, that's that second generation. That's the generation that we're walking, that we're seeing right now. Uh, so so prevalent is that is that they 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 like the big buildings, they like the big stuff, they like the big whatever, they like the big. The big everything, and they're after the venison, not after the God of the venison, right? not the God that created the venison. Are you with me here? I'm not talking about bad about venison. If you like deer meat, take deer meat. I'm just, I'm telling you, I'm telling you that 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 he had missed, he had missed the relationship and settled down for stuff. And therefore, who, what did he raise that next generation? A deceiver. A con artist. Someone that the only thing he had to get what God had was deception. Flesh. No hint of spirituality in Jacob. Why? Why? First generation was on fire. Second generation was not a heathen. But they didn't press in. So that third generation became indifferent. And that's not even to mention Esau, who represents sin. Jacob had a passion. He wanted what Abraham had. He just didn't know how to get it. Esau really didn't care. I I have it like this. Isaac lived in what Abraham had. 
Jacob was looking at a future without it. And so now he was trying to figure out, well, how do I get that? Have you ever seen, have you seen those memes on social media that says, says here's, here's the house my dad got for a quarter back in 1950. You know, here's what I get for a quarter, you know, whatever. In other, in other words, this generation is saying, I want the blessings that they have. I want the houses they had. I want the lands that they had. I wished I was back 25 years ago and, and could buy that all that kind of stuff. I don't even know how to get that. And so they remove from God. They work on Sundays. They work, you know, they work extra hard because we're gonna we're gonna save. We're gonna save. We're gonna do things our way instead of the way our parents did it. Mm, okay. If we don't keep the revival moving, if we don't keep the passion for the things of God to where our kids see it they will end up operating like Jacob. And it wasn't until Jacob. I love, we know that he met with God. God gave him a dream. He tithed. You know, how did he know to bring a tenth? How would Jacob have known to bring a tenth? Because he was taught it. We don't see, we don't see Isaac tithing at all. But do you think he tithed? I guarantee you he tithed because his daddy tithed. How did he know to give it to How come he didn't say, I'll give, a, I'll give a fifth? Because he'd been taught all his life to give. Mind your own business, Pastor Thad. Okay. He'd been taught all of his life to give a tenth, and he didn't do it. And then he met with God, and he said, God, if you'll bless me, I'll bring a tenth of all that I have to you. We know God blessed him. We know he did that. And then we see, and I love this because, because he gets to the point there where, where remember, Esau's looking for him. He's looking for Esau. And, and his, his men went out to find Esau. Beautiful. This is just sauce. His men went out to get Esau. And Esau says, yeah, I'll come see him. I'm going to bring 400 of my men with me. And so they come back and tell, tell him. And they go, okay, Esau's coming, but he's bringing 400 of his men. And, and, and Jacob's sure that he's going to die, that all the blessings that he set, thought he was going to have are going to be gone, right? I mean, this is how he, he's picturing it in his mind. It's gone. It's done. It's no longer, uh, you know, he's, he's fearful that everything he just got, he's going to lose. And so what does he do? He goes in a wrestling match with God. Remember, he split up two groups to maybe, and one, if one dies, the, we'll still have the other one, right? And then he's by himself and he gets in a wrestling with match with God and says, I will not let go until you bless me. See, that's a hunger. That's a passion for the things of God that we've got to distribute. We've got to show to the generations coming behind us. Can I show you one more generational blessing here? Hallelujah. Whew. Go to Ruth 4. I was ready when I was getting this message. I was ready with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And then I was reading something, and they brought up Joshua. And I said, oh, that's a good place to start right there because that's clear. And then just in meditating on things, I was like, this is another one. But see, this one is the other way. Look at this. Ruth chapter 4, verse 21 says in... And Salmon begat Boaz. So there's Boaz. Boaz and Ruth begot Obed. Obed begot Jesse. And Jesse gave birth to David. This, here we got four generations. Obed and Jesse we know significantly little about. 
outside of a few ge genealogies, generational lists, generational lists, we, we know nothing about Obed. I searched, and usually you can find some information about We know nothing really about Obed. Uh, Jesse, all we know about Je Jesse is pretty much in relationship with David. So what do we know about you? Well, okay, let, let's, let's start first generation, okay? We know a lot about David. We know a lot about Ruth. But Ruth was hungry. She gave up everything to be a part of Yahweh's system. She worked hard. She did everything she could do. She Again, she gave up her, her countrymen, her country, to take Naomi's God. And God showed up and showed off for her. She got everything she got because of relationship. Because of intimacy. Everything Ruth had was because of that time she spent with God. And again, Obed was not, not a whole lot. Jesse was grandson. What do we know about Jesse? We can assume some things. He obviously followed God. Um, he obviously trusted God. He obviously raised his sons to fear God. I mean, David didn't just by chance, happenstance go out into the, in the field and experience God. He, he learned that somewhere. But it was, it was him. It was his relationship. His personal... Let the wind blow. Tide roll. Let the earth know this God of love. It was that intimate time with just him and the God of his father. Where did he learn that? I'm guessing he learned it from his dad. A dad who didn't experience a lot, didn't have books written about him, but raised his sons. And what do we know about David? He was a man after God's own heart. He didn't wrestle with God. He made some mistakes. But see, you can't, beloved, can I say this? Don't be defined by your mistakes. Be defined by your relationship. I'm going to say that to this side over here. See if I have. Don't be defined by your mistakes. Be defined by your relationship. David wasn't defined by his mistakes. And he had, he had a whopper. He was defined by the heart he had after God. And he killed giants. And he took nations. And he raised a son after him. I don't have time to get into that generation because that generation kind of had that living, living what they, dad did, right? I don't know. Have you ever thought about this one? I, I, I don't know if I've ever thought like this. Remember what Ruth said in chapter one? Those covenant words. I know we don't see her slicing and blood and all that kind of stuff. But when she said, you're God, my God, your people, you're my people. If anything but death separates us. My great, great grandma, a woman of covenant, birthed Obed, birthed Jesse, brought forth Jesse and brought up a son who lived his whole life on covenant.
what do we do with this? Jesse, why don't you come to the piano, baby? What do we do with this, folks? We got a generation that is coming up. We got a generation, you could even say young adults. Young adults, you got generations below you. You got you got nieces, nephews, sons and daughters, all that kind of stuff that, that are that are coming underneath you. We've got we've got generations that if they don't see the passion for God in us, it's gonna be way too easy. For them to be satisfied seeking fleshly things. Just got to get my bills paid. But I hear the Spirit saying to us this morning, I'm calling my people unlike I've ever called them. Because outside of revival, this world has no hope. Outside of me, this world has no hope. And I've called every generation. Every generation has had those that have answered the call. But I am calling you this morning. To a relationship that is deeper than you've ever known. A heart that is more pliable than anything you've ever experienced. A life that is dependent. on Him and His Word. I'm looking for people who will listen to my voice. I'm looking for people who will take risks by faith. To experience His power to obey His Word. to step out in ways that will mark eternity and especially the next generation. What I'm calling you to (coughs) is going to make you nervous. But I have not called you to anything that will die with you. I have called you to everything. And I am calling you to this next thing, this next step, this next level of intimacy. Because I'm taking you somewhere that will will transform generations. of His glory revive shake this place in the light of His glory revive story the light of His glory There's revival stirring, shaking this place in the light of His glory. I hear chains, I hear chains 
all over the chains hit the ground with generations all over the place hear the chains hit the ground I'm seeing chains falling Holy Spirit is telling me that the renewal of your passion for my heart I will you return to me, I'll return to you. The renewal of your passion after the heart of God. I am today moving in to your seed. I'm seeing chains of bondage. You know, I'm seeing habits begin breaking right now. There are habits that have created shame in your in generations. Catch this. There are habits that they've done, that they've lived in, and it's created the shame and they won't come through the church. And I'm hearing the Holy Spirit say, well, if you'll renew, if you'll come to me, I'll come to you. And I'm, I'm going to be, I, I'm beginning to disintegrate those chains that have weighed them down. I have not called you to such a place as this for form and formality. He said, I've, I've had form and formality and I spew it. I've called you to this place for transformation of, of this city, this county, this state. This generation, the next generation, the generation to come. Recognizing the three generations of revival. Most of my life, I've seen a dad who sought, who would spend hours begging God for healing, anointings. Hungry. God called me to the ministry. I'm guessing when I was eight years old. I never knew anything in my life outside of about three years old. I wanted to be a mechanic. I wanted to be a football player, but being a football player was always with the with the asterisks next to it, I gotta be a pastor too. You know, I'm gonna can I be a football player and a pastor? Because I really like football, but I wanna be a, I know I'm I never knew anything else but to be a pastor. Went to college four years, got a got a degree, came home. became a youth pastor. Became a dad, became a youth pastor, went to Texas, came up here. And there's always been at the back of my heart, all you are is that second generation. All you are is that second generation. You're just living off of what dad has. And I think it's always been chain to hold me back. Good word, good preach. I, I think I'm a good preacher. I've never fallen asleep while I preach. I just always saw myself as that second generation. 
I was concerned myself that I was producing that third generation of hooligans. Holy Spirit, that's what I really like about that account in Ruth, is it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be the generation that's on fire and produces a generation that's mediocre. Why not the generation that's on fire produce a generation that's on fire that produces a generation that's on fire that just becomes a, a, a fire that overtakes the world? So this I say. I view myself different today. Probably the last three years I've had to start viewing myself different. I'm a man after God's own heart. I'm a man of covenant. I'm hungry. I don't want to be a church that just lives out the days, a passion that just lives out its days, going through the motions. I want everything He has. And I want this body of believers to have everything He has. And I speak to my seed. And I speak to my seed's seed. And I speak to your seed. And I speak fire like fire shut up in their bones. I'm seeing revival. Moms and dads, your kids are coming home. Because they've watched how you've lived. They've watched how you've walked around the walls. They've watched how you walked through dry land. I am telling you, they are coming home. And I'm telling you that those that are home, there's a fire that is igniting them like they've never been ignited. You ready for this one, folks? Your seed is going to get so on fire for God. That you're going to need a new dose of energy to keep up with their vision. Did you catch that? <laughs> we you know, we been we get it, we get it, we like this pace, and then those that younger generation comes along and they don't work the same pace. As much as I love everybody in this room, I will tell you this much, and I say this I, I say this um, well I'll say it the one person in my life that challenges me more than anybody else in my life. And I'm not saying anything about anybody, I'm telling you, but my younger generation. Ryan doesn't talk to me about stuff in the church without saying, Dad, we gotta do this, we gotta, need to think about doing this, let's make this change, let's make this change. And a lot of times the only thing in my head is like, oh great, that's a great idea, Ryan, how is that? What, what, what did I just say? We're going to have to start running, doing some things because that younger generation is going to. You know what he did to me the other day? He sends me a Zillow. How many remember me telling you on our trip to Indianapolis, he priced all the property around us, what it would take for us to buy all this property. This property that over here that's been burned down, is on sale for I think twenty five or twenty eight thousand dollars just for that lot. I'm like we we just lost our 
big as sour, big as Tyler. How are you? Yes. I better, I better start running. And I don't say that. I'm not just boosting him up. I'm telling you. That challenges me. What do I, what, what's my responsibility? Let's just go to God. Let's, let's find out what God's plan is. Let, let's, let's enter this. I want this block. I want to elevate it so we're no longer in the flood zone. And then I want to build, build, build a nice big building right here in the middle of everything. That's what I keep seeing inside of me. How's it going to happen, Pastor Thad? My job is intimacy. My job is here in the heart of God. His job. My favorite statements is what he... Stand with me so you... I, I could probably keep talking. One of my favorite statements is Jerry... Uh, God spoke to Jesse Duplantis and said, I didn't call you to pay for it. I called you to believe for it. Okay. I'll just believe for it. But our kids are watching us believe. So let's keep believing in cities. Let's keep taking down giants. Let's not be the generation that died in the wilderness, but the generation that is rising up and raising up generations. Amen?